Dr. Jeff is the, the, <clears throat> the coolest mathematician that I know. Oh, thank you, Joe. <laughs> That's an honor. Um, yeah, so um, for those who don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Donatelli. I'm a, I'm a research scientist in the, the math group at Barnes Berkeley Lab and also the, uh, the Center for Advanced Mathematics for Energy Research Applications for uh, cam uh, camera. And today I'm going to talk about uh, phase retrieval for uh, coherent diffractive, diffractive imaging. Um, so some of the theory behind it um, and, and algorithms uh, as well. Um, and I'll, I'll take several breaks throughout the talk um, for, for any questions that you may have. So fill up the queue, uh, feel free to queue up any questions uh, that you want to ask. Oops. All right, so this is what I mean by uh, coherent diffractive imaging. Um, so basically we have a sample and one sec, I want to use uh, the spotlight, there it is. So basically what I mean here is that you have a sample and you stick it in front of an X-ray beam. Um, it could also be electrons or neutrons, anything you want as well, but let's, let's just think of it as X-rays for now. Um, and then you shoot a, a, a series of X-rays at the sample, which then scatter off and um, form a diffraction pattern that you collect on a, on a detector. And so here I'm gonna basically assume the same kind of things uh, that Rick was uh, uh, mentioning. So basically that what we measure in this detector is the, the squared magnitude of the, the Fourier transform of the density of the sample. Uh, but in this talk, I'm also gonna assume that your sample uh, is actually small enough to actually fit uh, entirely uh, with the beam. And it's just a, a single uh, isolated object. It's not like a, a periodic crystal or anything like that. So for much of the talk, I'm going to sort of think in this, uh, this 2D case where your object is essentially um, sort of infinitely thin, um, or if it has some thickness, you're sort of measuring some kind of uh, a 2D projection of the, the 3D thing. Um, and then sort of as Rick was mentioning in his talk, um, if you want full three-dimensional structure, um, you're still only collecting a, a two-dimensional diffraction pattern. So for you to get three-dimensional information, you basically need to image the, the sample at lots of different uh, orientations. And so, for example, you can do this if your object is large enough uh, through a tomographic setup, where you're essentially just manually rotating your object in front of the beam. Or for instance, in single particle imaging, um, if, where you're working with tinier particles, that the particles just tend to tumble in front of the beam at random orientations when you image them. Um, but then essentially what you do is once you image at all those different orientations, you merge them together and then form a three-dimensional uh, diffraction volume as opposed to just a two-dimensional uh, image. And so um, the goal of the, the phase retrieval problem is basically to figure out um, how do we go from the diffraction data to the electron density of the sample. So in 2D, that goes corresponds to going from a, a single 2D image to the 2D density and 3D corresponds to going through the 3D diffraction volume uh, to the 3D uh, density of the sample. Um, so first I wanna go just go through some basic notation and formulation of the problem. Um, so throughout the talk, um, I'm, I'm gonna use this uh, notation to represent the coordinates, uh, a bold R to represent the, the real space coordinates. So this is the space that your sample lives in. And a bold Q to represent the Fourier space, which is sometimes called the reciprocal space uh, coordinates. And this is the space that your data lives in. And so uh, one of the main quantities of interest that we're after is the electron density rho uh, of the samples. This is the thing that we want to reconstruct from the data. And so a uh, related quantity is its Fourier transform. And here throughout the talk, I'm typically going to represent these with, uh, with hats. So here rho hat q is the Fourier transform of rho. Um, and then you can go backwards given the Fourier transform. You can get back to the density through the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, one small thing to note here is I'm using a slightly different convention for a Q compared to Rick. I have this uh, 2 pi um, in the exponential. Um, mainly this allows me to simplify some of the formulas. So uh, just remember that if you go back between the two conventions, you might have to multiply or divide by uh, 2 pi. Um, so here we're going to work with actually uh, computing thing, things numerically. So we're going to have to discretize things on a grid. And so when you do that um, and you want to compute a Fourier transform, uh, you have to compute the discrete uh, version, which basically turns the, uh, sum, uh, the, the integration into a summation uh, in each case. And then um, the, the final thing is the diffraction intensity. So this is the thing that we actually, actually measure in experiments. And again, this is, uh, this is the, the function i of q, which gives you the squared magnitude of the, the Fourier transform, uh, so rho hat of q. Um, 
And so now given this uh, basic notation, um, we can formulate our goal as now reconstructing the density rho from the measured intensity function i of q, which again gives you the, the squared magnitude of its uh, Fourier transform. And so as Rick mentioned, the reason why this is challenging is because in general, the, the Fourier transform is a, a complex uh, scalar for each q and each complex number has two components. It has a magnitude, and this is the thing that you actually measure from the diffraction. This is the square root of intensity. So this is the thing that we know, but then it's multiplied by a complex uh, phase factor of the form e to the i phi q, which has a unit magnitude. And so this is not measured in an experiment. So the thing is, uh, without any additional information, there's nothing to tell you how to pick these phases. So you somehow need additional constraints on the system um, in order to be able to, um, to recover uh, rho hat, which then allows you to recover the, the density uh, rho. And so the one constraint I'm gonna focus on today is the support constraint, which is related to the, the finite size of the uh, isolated object in the beam. And so what I mean by support is basically given an object, it's the region in space where it has non-zero density. So we take our image uh, with the face in it, it's basically all the pixels in the image uh, where the, the face has uh, some density to it. So it looks like this. And so now if we want to enforce the support in the, in the uh, inversion, then our goal now becomes uh, given a intensity function I of Q in some finite support region S, I'll talk about later on how we actually uh, come up with this support region. Um, now we want to find a density rho that satisfies uh, two constraints, uh, a Fourier magnitude constraint. So that's um, that the, the squared magnitude of the Fourier transform is equal to the measure intensity I and a support constraint. Uh, which is basically that um, given some specified support region S, so for example, here, this, this green box, we basically want our density or our object that we reconstruct to fit inside that, uh, that support region, that, that box in this case. All right, so before I move on to the next section, are there any uh, questions about the basic problem setup? Okay, I'll keep on going then. So now I want to talk about some of the uniqueness properties of the phase problem and also some conditions that you need to actually be able to solve it. So first, it, it turns out that there's a series of operations in which diffraction is completely invariant to, and that includes translation of the object in the domain, uh, multiplication by global phase factor, um, so essentially uh, changing the, the sign of the object, so like multiplying by minus one, uh, and inversion, so flipping it uh, uh, through the origin like you see here. And so the thing is, each of these operations has a well-known effect on the Fourier transform. You can just look these up on Wikipedia if you want, but here they are. Um, so for translation, it's equivalent to multiplying by this phase factor, e to the two pi i tau dot q. Uh, for the global phase factor, the second thing, it's equivalent to just multiplying by that factor, that sign, e to the i phi, uh, sorry, psi. And for inversion, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the inverted density is actually the complex conjugate of the, uh, the original Fourier transform. So the thing is diffraction can't actually distinguish between these operations, because again, uh, the, the intensity just measures the magnitude of the Fourier transform. And since these operations only affect the phase, they all have the same exact magnitude as the original uh, Fourier transform rho hat of Q. Um, but this is sort of okay because uh, each of these operations don't really change the fundamental structure uh, of what you're solving for. However, there's sort of a, a more serious form of non-uniqueness uh, that comes up. And this is something known as a, a homometric structures. And um, the way to set this up is if, if you suppose that your density rho can actually be represented as a convolution between two other functions or densities, uh, uh, f and g, uh, where the convolution is given by this summation here. Um, so in particular, these, this is our f and g, so our face, um, and for, we're here for g, we're taking it as a sum of three delta functions um, supported at these, uh, these r coordinates. Uh, so essentially g is something that's essentially a really large number or almost infinity um, here, here, and here, but a zero everywhere else inside that, uh, inside that image. So we take the convolution, convolution between these two things, um, then essentially what you do, uh, according to the summation formula, is you take your object f and you translate it to each pixel uh, in your image g. You then multiply by the, the intensity of that pixel uh, and then you average that result over all the pixels and that'll give you your, your convoluted uh, image. 
So for in, in this case, where G is just three delta functions, this actually ends up being pretty simple. You just take the face and translate it to each of these R's and then average the results. Uh, in this case, there's actually no overlap when you do that. So you just get three copies of the face like you see here. And this will give you your, your, your convolution for, uh, for row R here. Uh, so there's a theorem known as the convolution theorem that tells us what the Fourier transform of this convolution looks like. Uh, and it ends up being pretty simple. It's just you can represent the Fourier transform row hat of Q as the product of the Fourier transforms of uh, F and G. And so this allows you to form what's known as a homometric structure. It's basically a different structure that actually has the same uh, Fourier magnitudes. Um, and the way to do this is to form this new function row H which is now the convolution between the inverted F, so flipping it through the origin, that's one of the operations I showed you in the last slide, um, and the, the unflipped or the uninverted G. And so by the convolution theorem, uh, this Fourier transform is the product of the, uh, the inverted Fourier transform of F and then, uh, and then G hat. And then we, if we take the magnitude of all this, uh, the magnitude of a product is the product of the magnitudes. And then as I mentioned on the last slide, uh, the Fourier transform of the inverted F actually has the same magnitude as the original uh, Fourier transform of F. And so that means when you go through all this, um, that um, the, the magnitude of the, the Fourier transform of row H is the same as uh, the original row. Um, but the thing is, uh, this new row H gives you something that uh, looks, has sort of a different structure to it. It's what you see here in the, the bottom right where you're sort of flipping uh, all the individual components. So it, it is actually sort of a different structure, um, but it, it, it still gives you something with the same Fourier magnitudes. So this is something that your diffraction intensities can't distinguish uh, these two homometric structures. So th this is a problem. So the question is how often does this happen? Uh, so it actually turns out that in 1D, almost all 1D functions have homometric structures. Uh, so this is kind of important if you ever, ever actually wanna sort of uh, try to code up a solution to the phase problem. You never want to start testing in 1D because it turns out you can almost never uniquely solve uh, the structure in that case. Uh, fortunately, in two and higher dimensions, these homometric structures are extremely rare. So in, in higher dimensions, you can almost never represent a function as the convolution between two uh, non-center non symmetric objects. Uh, what I mean by non-center symmetric is that if you flip it, you get something different like the, uh, the face in this case. Um, and so you, you rarely run into this issue in higher dimensions. There are known physical structures that have this, but you sort of need very specific symmetry to run into this uh, ambiguity. All right, before I move on to some of the uh, solvability conditions, uh, I first want to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between, uh, once you discretize things, the relationship between uh, the, the, the discrete grid in real space versus Fourier space. And so to go from this, uh, real space grid to the Fourier space grid. Uh, this is involves a discrete Fourier transform, and then to go back and involves an inverse Fourier transform. And if you want this process to be invertible, you sort of need the same grid points uh, in each uh, space. So the thing is, uh, there's actually a nice relationship between the spacing and the sizes of these two grids. And that's given by what I have here on the right. So the, the sampling rate or the grid spacing in real space, delta R, you can actually show that it's equal to one over the the length k of your Fourier space grid. And then sort of vice versa, the sampling rate or the distance between your grid points in Fourier space delta q is equal to one over L, the length of your uh, real space grid. And so you have this sort of uh, reciprocal relationship uh, between the two grids. That's why sometimes Fourier space is called reciprocal space to sort of highlight this uh, relationship. Um, so if we sort of explore this a bit further, then what happens if we, if we take this original real space grid and double the sampling rate, so we add these green points to it, um, which uh, decreases the, uh, the distance delta r by a factor of two, then in Fourier space, that's equivalent to um, doubling the length of your Fourier space grid. So now you're sampling further out in Q, so you're adding these green points on the outside. If we go in the other direction, uh, so in real space, if we instead, um, double the length of the grid, so we're adding these green points on the outside now, then in Fourier space, that corresponds to doubling the sampling rate or the, the grid spacing delta Q, like you see here. And so to highlight this a bit more, uh, let's, let's go through actual images to see what this looks like. 
So here's sort of our base case. Uh, so here we're taking the length of the, the real space grid to be the same as the diameter of the particle. So the particle just fits inside that grid. If you then take its Fourier transform, then you get Fourier data at, uh, at, what's, what called, at what's called the, uh, the Shannon sampling rate, meaning that the grid spacing is equal to one over the, the particle diameter. And as you can see here, when you sample just at the Shannon sampling rate, you get something that's sort of pixely, but sort of has all the main details that you need to sort of go back. Um, and then if you were to actually invert this with the inverse Fourier transform to get back to the original structure. However, if we then take our real space grid and double its length, so it's now twice the diameter of the particle, then in Fourier space, you get something called uh, oversampling. Uh, so now your, your, your grid spacing delta Q is um, half the Shannon sampling rate. So it's one over uh, 2D in this case. And as you can see, the effect there is now you get something that's much uh, smoother. And so this, this second uh, case here is gonna end up being important um, for, for some of the solvability conditions that we need. So in particular, we have a theorem that says, um, if you have an intensity I, that's the squared magnitude of the Fourier transform rho, then you can actually uh, uh, uniquely reconstruct rho from that intensity up to those three uh, diffraction variant operations I told you about before, translation, multiplication by global phase factor and inversion. Uh, if uh, one, the Fourier magnitudes are oversampled by a factor of at least two. So that's what I showed you on that, that last slide. So this means that either your diffraction data in Fourier space uh, is sampled at a rate of delta Q less than or equal to one over twice the particle diameter. And again, that's equivalent to essentially zero padding in real space by a factor of two. So the, the length of your real space domain is at least twice the size of your object. And the second condition you bet you need is that you can't, uh, your, your density row cannot be represented as a convolution between two non-symmetric functions. So that prevents that, um, uh, that ambiguity that I showed you before, uh, which as I mentioned is actually extremely uh, rare in a, a two and higher dimensions. Um, and so if you satisfy both of these conditions, uh, then it turns out that you can you essentially uniquely resolve, uh, reconstruct the sample uh, from the intensity data. All right, so before I go on to the next part, are there any uh, questions so far? This condition you mentioned just now, is that mm -hmm. satisfied in experiments in real life? Um, as long as your, your sample is uh, small enough and you have enough uh, pixels in your detector. Um, if, you can, if you have a really large sample, um, then, then maybe you don't have enough pixels to, to satisfy that Shannon sampling rate. But if your sample is small enough and you have enough pixels, then it's usually okay. Okay. Also, the theorem states that it is then possible, but does it tell you how? No, nope, that's the next section. Yeah, all right. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So what, what if there's a free nail diffraction, not a far field diffraction? Um, well, okay, that's a different story. Uh, that that's sort of beyond the scope of this talk. So here, I'm 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 mainly assuming uh, far uh, far field. So that that's for another talk. Okay. okay. Anything else? Okay. So now let's actually talk about how do we solve this thing. Um, so again, just as a quick recap, our goal is. Uh, given an intensity function i in the support region S, we want to find a density uh, row of R that satisfies uh, two things, a magnitude constraint, so that the squared magnitude of the Fourier transform is equal to the intensity i, and a support constraint. So we want the, 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 our, our solution, uh, our density row, to fit inside some specified uh, support region uh, that we give it. So again, uh, this, this green box, uh, for example. And to be able to solve this, um, as I mentioned uh, just on the, the, the previous slide, um, you need to either oversample the diffraction pattern by a factor of at least two, so that the Q spacing is less than one over twice the, uh, the particle diameter. And again, this is equivalent to uh, zero padding in real space by a factor of two. Uh, so in this case, this means that your, the support that you choose has to be less than or equal to at least one fourth of the domain in order for you to solve the, the problem. 
So um, before I actually get into the algorithms, I first want to sort of complain a bit about why the phase problem is so difficult. And this is due to an issue known as uh, non-convexity. So if we don't define an error functional E of rho as basically how far away the density rho is from satisfying the magnitude constraints. So basically to solve the phase problem, we want to um, find where this is zero. Um, then if you have a convex optimization problem, it sort of looks like this. So you want to find the minimum of this function E. And so the, usually the way you optimize these things is through something uh, basically as steep as descent based method, like gradient descent, Newton's method, BFGS, and there's lots of other things as well. And all these methods are based on um, basically looking at the gradient and then following that gradient direction until you reach um, the minimum of the function. So you can essentially think of it as taking a ball and placing it somewhere along this curve and this essentially allowing it to drop uh, along gravity, uh, according to gravity, which will take you along this gradient direction directly to the bottom, uh, to the global minimum, which is what you want. However, a non-convex optimization problem looks more like this, where depending on where you take the ball and drop it, so say in this uh, left region here, it might fall and get stuck in this local minima. If you drop it all the way at the very right, it gets stuck in another local minima. In order to, for you to actually find uh, the solution, which is at the global minima, you have to be lucky and start somewhere uh, in this middle region. So that, that makes um, standard steepest descent methods sort of tricky, which are sort of based on this sort of ball drop analogy. So the thing is, it turns out the phase problem is highly non-convex, which makes it uh, difficult to solve. And to sort of visualize what's going on here, here's a simple four pixel example. We're here for the density. I'm just, um, I'm giving it four pixels, row one, row two, row three, row four, which each have a different pixel value. And then outside that, I'm, everything is just set to zero to satisfy the, the 2x uh, uh, zero padding uh, solvability condition. Uh, so here's what its intensity function looks like. And now I want to visualize what the error looks like, the error functional looks like. Uh, so the thing is, um, you can't really visualize it for all row one through row four because that's a four dimensional thing. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to fix row three and row four to their correct values. And then I'm just going to vary row one and row two to see how the error changes as a function of those variables. And if you do that, you get this plot here that I show you on the right. So here, <clears throat> blue is essentially low values for the error. Red is high, uh, yellow and green are somewhere in the middle. Uh, the, the white lines are the, the contours of it and the, the green arrows are the, the gradient. So you see here, there's essentially four minima that you could potentially get stuck in. There's the three um, local minima that I pointed out in red here, which is if you get stuck there, uh, that's not what you want. That doesn't correspond to the solution. The only one that does is the global minima, this blue dot here. So depending on where you start, if you're just to perform a normal steepest descent method, chances are you, you're probably gonna end up getting stuck in one of these local minima instead of the thing that you want. And then the thing that makes this even worse is that um, essentially for every pair of pixels that you have in your real space image, you sort of run into this kind of situation here where you have sort of four local minima in the error. Um, so that means that the number of local minima actually scales exponentially uh, in the grid size. Um, so this means uh, any kind of steepest descent based method that you have sort of has to navigate its way around sort of like a sea of local minima so you don't get stuck in a non-optimal solution. All right, so now, now I'm done complaining about why the problem is so hard. Now let's talk about how to actually solve it. And so um, the, the methodology that I'm going to base the solution on here today is something called uh, iterative projection algorithms. And the way these iterative projection algorithms work are based on defining what's called a, a Bregman projection operator for each of your constraints. And so what these projections do is given some kind of object, uh, x, like this, uh, this blue dot here, and some kind of constraint set C that you want to impose on that object, this uh, uh, gray curve here, uh, what the projection does is it, is it maps the object to the closest point uh, on that constraint set, uh, this green dot here. And that gives you your projected quantity uh, PC of X. So um, to, use, to use these projections to solve something with multiple constraints, like we have in the phase problem where we have two main constraints, um, there's something called an alternating projection scheme. And so the way this works is that if you wanna find an X that satisfies two constraints A and B, what you do is you generate a random initial start uh, X zero, and then you iteratively compute this formula over and over again. So basically you take your, your current iterate, iterate uh, XN, and then to get to the next one, 
you apply the PA projection to project XN to the closest point satisfying the A constraint, and then PB the projected to the, the B constraint. And that gives you your new iterate XN plus one, which you then feed back to the beginning and just loop over and over again until convergence. So what this actually looks like um, is sort of uh, depicted here on the right. So I'm gonna start with a point X zero at the bottom here. Um, and then we wanna impose these two constraints on it. Um, the A constraint is that it lies on this blue line and the B constraint is that the point lies on this red line. And so we wanna find something that satisfies both the constraints, which is this purple intersection point. And so uh, essentially what this uh, scheme does is we, we take our uh, X zero and we first apply the PA constraint to project it to the closest point on A. And then we apply PB to project it to closest point to B. And that gives us our new iterate X1. And now we project it back to A, back to B, back to A, back to B, and we keep going. And if we let this run long enough, you see eventually it converges to the intersection, which is the, the point that we want it. So the question now becomes, how do we apply this to the phase problem? So sort of just like an example I just showed you, we have sort of two main constraints, the magnitude constraint and the support constraint. So first, essentially we need these Bregman projection operations for each one. So for the magnitude constraints, uh, we have a magnitude projection. And so essentially given a, a density rho, we want to project it to the closest thing satisfying the magnitude constraints. Um, so in Fourier space, it ends up being quite easy to do. So for each fixed Q, rho hat of Q is just a, a single complex number. So if you wanted to be, you, if you wanted to project it to something that has magnitude I, that just involves renormalizing it. So dividing out by uh, uh, its magnitude, so the magnitude of rho hat of Q, and then multiplying by uh, what the magnitude should be, uh, square root of I in this case. Uh, so uh, graphically, this corresponds to, um, so rho, rho hat of Q is just a, a number, it's the point in the complex plane, this blue dot. Um, and the set of all things with correct magnitude is this gray circle, which has radius uh, root I of Q uh, centered at zero in, in, uh, in the, the complex plane. And so this projection projects the, the blue uh, point to the closest uh, point on the, the circle. So that's how you do this in Fourier space, but we're also gonna want a real space representation. And that turns out to be easy to get as well. All you have to do is take its, uh, the inverse Fourier transform of this uh, p hat m uh, p hat term, and that'll give you a real space representation of this projection. And the reason why this is also a, a Bregman projection, because uh, again, recall that the definition of Bregman projection is that you're projecting to the closest point, uh, the closest object satisfying the constraint. Um, but you have something called Parseval's theorem that basically says distances in Fourier space are the same as distances in real space. So if you project to the closest point in Fourier space, it's also going to be the closest point in real space. So that makes um, PM a, a Bregman projection as well, which is what we want. All right, so we also need this for the support constraint. We need a support projection. That ends up being easy to compute as well. Um, all you do is you take your, um, your density rho and you zero it out everywhere outside the support region. Uh, so pictorially, this corresponds to um, taking your image and then just figuring out where it extends beyond uh, the support region, this, this green box here. And wherever it does, you just chop off the density. But everywhere inside, you just leave it alone. And then that'll give you the, the support projected density uh, of PS row. So if we apply these methods in the alternating projection scheme that I showed you before, we get something called the error reducing or uh, ER method, uh, which I have here on the top right. Um, so all this does is just like I showed you before, you start with, in this case, a random initial density row zero. And then during the nth iteration, um, you take your current iterate row N, and then you apply the magnitude constraint to project it to the closest thing consistent with the magnitude constraint. And then you apply the, uh, the, the PS, the, um, the support projection to project it to the closest thing consistent with the support constraint. And that gives you your new iterate row N plus one. And then you plug that back into the, the beginning and then you apply PMPS again over and over again until you converge. So if you write out all the operations involved in these projections, you get this sort of flow chart here on the right. Um, so again, what we do is we start with a random initial density rho here at the top left. We compute its Fourier transform to get rho hat. We then apply uh, the magnitude projection in Fourier space, uh, PM hat, uh, to project it to the closest thing consistent with the measured intensity data. So that gives us uh, PM, uh, P hat M uh, rho hat. Uh, 
We then take its Fourier transform to get its real space representation PM rho. And then we apply the support projection in real space uh, to project it to the closest thing consistent with the, uh, the support region. And that takes you back to the beginning of the loop and you just keep iterating over this until convergence. So if you, if you define uh, the error like I did before, E of rho, which again gives you, tells you basically how far away rho is from satisfying the, uh, the magnitude constraint, um, there's some, turns out there's some nice properties of ER that you can show. So one is that you can actually show the error decreases monotonically. So the error uh, of the n plus one iterate is actually less than or equal to the error at the previous uh, nth iterate. So the error is always sort of uh, going down or staying the same uh, between iterations. And the second property is you can show uh, that one step of ER is actually equivalent to uh, projected gradient descent. Um, so one step of gradient descent is this middle thing here. So you just subtract off one half of the gradient of the error. And then um, what you do then is you apply the support projection uh, to that uh, uh, gradient descent iteration. So essentially this is sort of equivalent to doing just classical gradient descent on the, um, on the support surface or, or manifold. But the second property actually ends up being a problem because I was, as I was just complaining, uh, the phase problem is highly non-convex. So anything based on steepest descent, like gradient descent, will quick, quickly get trapped in local minima. And in fact, here on the right is actually an example of what you get if you apply ER uh, to the intensity of the phase like, that I keep showing you. And here I'm actually making things a bit easier by using a very tight support. Uh, is a circle instead of a box here, which sort of tightly fits in the, the, the face. So if we run ER on this, you get this movie that you see here on the right. Uh, so we start with just random noise for the, the initial density. If we let this run, you see we sort of quickly get into sort of something with some of the correct features, but then it gets stuck there and it can't improve. Uh, so sort of right away, it gets trapped in a local minimum and can't get itself out of it. So you, you sort of converge to something that's kind of non-ideal. So one way to fix that is to use a good uh, global optimizer, such as the uh, hybrid input-output or HIO scheme that I have here. It's sort of similar to ER in nature. Um, the main difference is that, um, so ER, basically after you apply the, the PM projection, it's sort of, what ER does is everything inside the support, it just takes PM as is, and outside the support, it sets things to zero. In HIO, um, you do the same thing within the support, but outside the support, instead of setting things to zero, what you do instead is you apply this negative feedback term that you see down here, uh, rho n minus beta uh, PM rho n. And the effect, the effect that this negative feedback term has is that if you start to converge to a local minima that's inconsistent with the support constraint, then that'll actually cause this term in the bottom to start blowing up. And it, it, at some point, it'll eventually kick you out of that local minima. And you can control the amount of kick that you have through this beta parameter here which always has to be between zero and one if you wanna uh, be able to converge. Um, if you make it smaller, you have a smaller kick, which makes things more stable, which is nice. Uh, but if you choose a larger beta, you get a larger kick, which gives you a better chance of escaping local minima. Um, but um, if you draw the flow chart for this, it's sort of just like what you get for ER. The only difference is you do something slightly different uh, in, in, uh, in real space. Basically, again, instead of zeroing things outside the support, you apply this negative feedback uh, term instead. But otherwise, the process is sort of identical. And so, um, so here's some of the properties for HIO. The first one is that you can show that HIO actually does not get stuck in any local minima that are inconsistent with the support constraint. In fact, you can show that if you ever reach a fixed point, uh, so that means um, rho n plus one is equal to rho n, then you can actually show that uh, PM, the, the magnitude projection of rho n, actually satisfies the support constraint. And since it's a magnitude projection, that means it also satisfies the magnitude constraint. Since it satisfies both constraints, that means it solves the phase problem. So you've converged to the thing that you want, which is great. Uh, but the second property is not so great, and that's that the error is not monotonic. So in between iterations, the error might go down, it might go up. And in practice, what you see is it tends to bounce all over the place. So usually what people do is they sort of combine HIO and ER to try to get the best of both worlds. Uh, so in particular, the way this is done is you, you sort of cycle between applying several iterations of HIO then several iterations of ER and then go back and forth. And this allows you to use HIO to escape all the local minima 
but then it uses ER to essentially reduce uh, the error and sort of refine the solution. And so if we go back to our face example, um, so here I'm going to combine HIO and ER to see if we can do a bit better than before. So here I'm using 0.99 for the, the beta parameters, so I'm giving a large kick. And here I'm using 12 cycles, each consisting of 400 HIO iterations and 200 uh, ER iterations. And again, again I'm giving a, a tight uh, circle, uh, circle of support, if you see here. And so if we, um, if we run this, so again, I'm going to start with a random initial density for row zero. And then as I run this, I'm first going to run 400 HIO iterations. That gives me this. So you can see here, um, you, there's all this junk building up outside the support. So that, that's this negative feedback term that's trying to, that's starting to blow up um, to sort of try to kick you out of a, a local minima. But then if we switch back to ER, it tries to clean that up a bit. Then we go back to HIO, then back to ER, and back to HIO. And as you can see, each time we go through this process, things start to get better and better. And if we let this run long enough, then as you see, we start to get some converge to something that's pretty good. And now it's just cleaning up some of the high resolution detail and eventually converges to something that's essentially perfect, if you see there. All right, and just to convince you that this also works on things more complicated than just the face, uh, here's an example of applying this to the cameraman test image that I show on the, the, the left. Uh, so in the top middle is what its uh, Fourier magnitudes look like if you just take its uh, discrete Fourier transform. And here I'm gonna enforce a, a box support, uh, which, which just fits the, uh, the, the shape of the, the image. But then we're gonna run the same HIO uh, in, uh, uh, ER steps on it. So again, I'm gonna start with a random initial density. And then if you let this run, this is what you get. So again, you can sort of see right away, it sort of gets the main features of the cameraman. And then it spends most of the, the rest of the time in just trying to sort out some of the, um, the high resolution detail. You can see like right now, it's sort of stuck in this, this wave pattern that's trying to clean up. And then if you let this run long enough, it starts to converge to something that's looking pretty decent. And it might even be hard to see what's going on now, but it's just sort of cleaning up uh, just a few of the, the high resolution features. And then eventually it converges to something that's uh, essentially perfect. I think it, where is that now? And so it works uh, for the cameraman as well. All right, so today I mainly just focused on two specific iterative phasing schemes, the HAO and the R method. There's tons of other iterative phasing methods that you can apply as well. Um, here's, some, here's two of, of some of the more popular ones. I'm not going to go into too much detail about them other than just uh, mention that they exist. Um, so at the top, there's the RAR or Reflexed Average Alternating Reflection Scheme. Um, it basically has properties somewhere in between ER and HIO in terms of um, uh, stability and ability to escape local minima. And at the bottom, I have the Difference Map or DM Scheme, uh, which I think Joe is actually going to show you some examples of uh, next in, in Python. Um, and this actually has behaviors some pretty similar to HIO, except it has a, a few more uh, parameters that you can uh, tweak with to get slightly different uh, properties out of. All right, and so the one thing that you might be complaining about is that I, I might be cheating a bit since I'm giving myself a really nice support in those, uh, those phasing examples. So what do you do if you don't have a good initial estimate of the support region S? And so to... Um, one thing you can do is this technique called shrink wrap, where you essentially try to refine the support region S during the reconstruction. And so the way this works is that you can uh, start initially with a very loose uh, support domain, um, usually just roughly the size of the sample. T typically, you have an idea of how big your sample is uh, before you, you image it. And as long as you're sort of like in the ballpark of, of the right size, um, um, you can sort of start with a, a support of, the, uh, of that size. And so then what you do is you perform a cycle of a bunch of HIO uh, in your ER iterations with that uh, initial new support. And then you try to update the support by taking the last density that you have and then uh, smearing it out by convolving it with a Gaussian filter. So that looks like this. So it's just sort of cleaning up a bit of the noise. And then after that, you apply a threshold operation. So you choose some uh, cutoff uh, value tau, and basically everywhere in that image where the density is above tau, you take it to be part of your new support region S that you're gonna use in later rounds of, of phasing. 
And then once you do that, um, you sort of just repeat this process until convergence. So you go back and do more cycles of, um, of HIO and ER, then you update the support again and just go back and forth. Um, so here, there, there's sort of two main parameters that you have to choose for this. There's the width of the Gaussian. Uh, so usually I just take this to be the size of the, uh, the real space grid spaces. So the distance between your, your real space grid points, which seems to work pretty well. Um, and usually the only thing that you have to play around with in phasing is this uh, cutoff parameter tau, uh, the, the, the threshold parameter. And so you, usually I, I take it to be a few percent of whatever the current maximum density is. And that, that tends to work uh, decently well. So if we apply this uh, to the face example again, where now I'm starting with a looser a, a box support constraint S on the right, um, then if we let this run, again, we start with a random initial density. And so what we do now is we do our HO iterations, that gives us this, and then we do several ER iterations. And then once, that, once that's done, we do a, a round of shrink wrap. So we smear that density out, we apply a threshold to it, and that gives us a new support estimate S, which we're going to use in the next round of phasing. So then we go back to more HIO iterations with that new support, more ER iterations, and then we do another round of shrink wrap. So smear it out, apply a threshold that gives us an even better support estimate. And then we do more, more HIO, more ER. And now we're starting to converge to something that's a pretty tight uh, estimate of the support S, like you see on the right. And we're also starting to hone in on a pretty good estimate of the density. And now we're just cleaning up some of the high resolution detail. So we just continue this process. Then eventually we convert to something that's essentially perfect. I think right there. There we are. All right, and sort of just to finish up, uh, just to sort of prove to you that you can actually do this on real scientific examples. Uh, here's an example of applying this in 3D uh, to diffraction data um, from a, uh, an actual protein. Uh, and so here, uh, uh, the, the target object is this retinoblastoma, retinoblastoma uh, tumor suppressor protein, or PRB. And so here, instead of imaging from a, just a single two-dimensional diffraction image, we have a three-dimensional uh, diffraction volume. Um, uh, so just to make things clear, this, this picture here is this for kind of visualization purposes. Um, the actual data I'm giving it is actually um, um, basically all values on a, on a 3D Cartesian grid. I don't actually have something that's, that's cut out anywhere. I, I have sort of data every, uh, everywhere on that grid. And so if we apply the same ER HIO shrink wrap uh, to this diffraction data, um, then you get the result on the right. Um, so initially, again, we're just gonna start with a random uh, density here. Oh, if you're not sure exactly what you're looking at, usually the way you visualize these 3D densities is by representing them as a isodensity surface. So uh, for example, on the, on the image here, uh, that's basically the, the surface where the, the density is a constant value uh, within your, your three-dimensional grid. And so that gives you an idea of the, the shape that you're reconstructing. And so initially it's just random noise. So that's why it just looks like a bunch of junk there right now. But then if we run phasing on this, this is what you get. And again, you can sort of see that right away, it gets the main shape of it. And then it spends most of the rest of the time just honing in on uh, some of the finer details. And then if you let this run long enough, it starts to converge to something that's pretty decent and it's almost identical match to the, uh, the ground truth. All right, so that's, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, uh, here today. Um, so what I showed you here today was basically an example on sort of a, a simple but yet challenging problem. So that's phase retrieval from coherent diffractive imaging of a small isolated object using just a support constraint. But you can extend this methodology to lots of other more complicated problems uh, and experiments as well. And if you want to learn more about how to do that, that's what many of the talks uh, uh, tomorrow are, uh, are on. Um, so I encourage you to, to attend those as well. Um, so thank you all for uh, coming to my talk and for listening. Uh, let me know if you have any other uh, questions. Hi, um, I've got a quick question just about that last video. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bit of wiggle in the reconstruction that you were seeing mm -hmm. when the video played. Is that the um, translational invariance thing that you were talking about just yep. then? Or? Yep, that's exactly it. Sweet.
Hi, uh, I got a question. Uh, first, thanks for the talk. Um, let's say you got no clue for the support whatsoever. Uh, is the autocorrelation a good starting point? Uh, yeah, it could be. Um, you, I mean, usually the autocorrelation is a bit big. I mean, if, if you could start with that and maybe end up with something decent. Usually the only issue in practice, um, I, I guess Rick briefly mentioned this, if you have a large beam stop, um, you might be missing a lot of uh, values uh, near the, the origin in Fourier space. Um, and so if you start with a support that's too loose, um, you might not be able to deal with that amount of missing information as well. Um, so it, it, it sort of depends on how complete your data is, whether you want to whether you want to risk um, starting with something so loose or not, if that makes sense. Um, if, if you are missing any data, in some sense, you can compensate for that by using a tighter support. Um, so if, if you have no big missing gaps in your data, um, then yeah, starting with autocorrelation, autocorrelation can work. And a lot of people actually do that uh, in practice. Tom says, is there a relationship between how tight the support and strain needs to be and how high the resolution is? Um, well, I guess if you're, yeah, somewhat. Um, so I, I, ideally in these, these phasing algorithms, if you, if you give it a loose support and you don't refine it, um, then HIO and ER tends to not work as well. Um, so if you want, if you want to get all the high resolution details through, through these methods, you, you, you want to get something that's pretty tight. Um, and to go to really high resolution, usually you want the support to end up being maybe, uh, less than like maybe one or two pixels away from the, the, the true support of the object. Um, usually if, if you're trying to reconstruct something like a protein, it's actually pretty doable to actually get that, uh, through something like shrink wrap. Um, but yeah, have, having a tight support is really important if, if you if you want to get that that high resolution detail. And uh, and Sam says, how is S defined for a realistic experiment? I guess that's the the shrink wrap. The answer. Yeah, shrink yeah wrap. You, you just do it through through shrink wrap. Okay. So I mean, you, usually, like what I do in practice is you kind of know the you have an idea of how big the the particle is, an estimate of the diameter. Um, Maybe not, maybe not exact, maybe just within like 10, 20, 30%. So you start with something that's maybe a little bit generous, maybe something slightly bigger. And then you use shrink wrap to refine that. I have kind of a quick follow-up question. Are, are uh, supports always hard cutoffs? Is it just zero and one? Or are there any like, you know, soft edges or anything to supports? I would imagine that having a hard edge can, can maybe cause some, I don't know, ringing artifacts or something like that. Yeah, you're, you're right. You can, you, you don't have to make it as a hard constraint. Um, I don't know of too much work off the top of my head that actually uses this, but yeah, in, in principle, you're right. If you, if you have a um, sort of a smoother uh, a transition between the support region and the non-support region, then you might want to relax that a bit uh, to get better results. Um, I, I've sort of been thinking in the back of my head, nice ways to do that, but yeah, you're exactly right. Um, for, for some samples that have that transition, it, it might be better to do something softer than, than that hard cutoff. When you had these projections, uh, you had two, but I guess you could also have three or more that you iterate through. Oh, Is yeah. That... If you uh... If you want to see how crazy it can get, uh, you should attend my talk uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, some of the stuff I do, there might be like 10 projections that you can throw into it. So you, you can go crazy with the number of projections that you have if you put it up correctly. And then, so this means if you have 10, that you have 10 different ideas about how your solution should look like. So 10 different constraints that you add in this way. Yeah, and some yeah, so yeah, essentially each constraint that you add, um, you 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 kind of want another uh, projection for it. The distance uh, in which you measure how how close you are to to the solution that you're looking for, the the error that you estimate, uh, I guess that's in the L two norm that you have, or as a L two value squared. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think L2 norm is the most natural because then uh, you can use that isom uh, that, that Parcival's uh, theorem I showed you before, and that allows you to relate basically error in Fourier space to the error yeah. in real space. And it's sort of the error in real space that you care about. Um, yeah. You don't what have to use L2. The L1 but... distance or, or some, you know, some sparsity or so in, in some basis, is that also possible to do that? So you can, yeah, I mean, you can formulate these projections um, using a, uh, norms other than, than L2. So in, in particular, um, there, there's ways to do yeah L1 to try to come up with some kind of more um, sparsity-based constraint. And so all that works as well too. Um, you usually just have to be careful. Sometimes if you make the, the norm too exotic, you might not have a good way to compute the projection. Um, there are lots of cases where you can still do it with the L1 and it, and it works well. So it just depends on uh, what kind of the, the nature of the constraint that you want to impose on it. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Jeff? Well, I would be interested how um, errors in the intensities would affect the procedure. Uh, I know that he might not have an answer, but um, I've always wondered. Oh no, that, that's when you oh, in practice. Uh, that's that's usually the challenge. That's always what you're dealing with, because uh, because real data is never uh, error free. Um, and, and you're right. So the, the one issue that has is um, so like specifically for the HIO method, like I mentioned, it never converges if you reach something that's inconsistent with the support constraint. So the problem is, is if you have if you have good data, there is an object with the correct support that's consistent with that data. But once you add uh, a decent amount of noise to that data, that's no longer the case. So you might not actually have something that it can exactly satisfy both the magnitude and support constraint anymore once you have noisy data. Um, and so that usually the, what that causes is it prevents HIO from converging um, uh, uh, nicely. Um, so there's one hack that I, I've been trying to use to get around that, and it's it's basically adding another projection on top of these iterative phasing loops, um, which which try to model what the what you think the clean image is if you have a good estimate of the noise. So so basically, if you try to directly fit to the noisy data, you're going to run into trouble because it's going to be inconsistent with support constraint. But what you can do instead is try to relax that condition. So instead of trying to exactly match the data. Um, you might instead want to only enforce, enforce yourself to be within a certain distance of the data, where that distance is going to depend on the noise level. And then if you do that, you, you relax the constraint there a little bit, and now you're able to find something that's consistent with the support constraint as well. Um, so you're right, uh, deal, dealing with noise is, is the challenge, but there are, there are some good ways to, to deal with that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really good. This is like a consulting session for, for you know, Dr. Donatelli, the IPA specialist. Um, the IPA I, Center. I've, I've yeah. got another question. Uh, there's a yeah, comment yeah. here in the chat saying, in a way, crystal diffraction does not oversample twice in each dimension, but only mm -hmm. once, and therefore does not satisfy this condition. Yep. Um, I don't quite understand what that means but it's pretty relevant to what I'm working on at the moment. Um, could you get a comment on that a little bit? Um, yeah, so, well, it's, I don't, I don't have an image. Well, yeah, so the main assumption I was working with here is that you have a single isolated object. So the, the image that you get on the, on the detector is something that's continuous, like what you get here. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is exactly satisfying that, that sampling condition. So the distance between uh, pixels that you, that you measure is one over that, that twice the, the particle diameter. Then you're sort of set. Uh, the thing is, if you don't have a, an isolated object anymore, you have a periodic object. So now that's, uh, so we can draw it. So you have another face here. Let's apologize for my horrible drawing skills. Another one here, another one here. Hopefully you get the point. Then your diffraction data won't look smooth and continuous like this anymore. Instead, what you're going to see is you're going to get isolated peaks. So it's going to look more like this. Mm -hmm. And so forth. So the thing is here, 
and these peaks, you, you essentially get a, a large measurement at the peaks, but almost no signal in between. And so the thing is, the distance between these peaks where you actually get measurements uh, actually ends up being uh, just the uh, just the Shannon condition, so one over D, whereas what you need is delta Q is uh, one over two D. Right. Okay. So that does, does that make sense? Is yeah, it, a little bit. Peaks don't sample at, at the required rate to do this kind of phasing. Right. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So at eight twenty a.m. in Melbourne. Rick Millane will talk about exactly this thing. So please come to that talk. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I'm actually in Melbourne, but Melbourne, Australia at the moment. So it's very early. Yeah, that's here. why I said 8 a.m. for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for getting up this early. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Thank you. Thanks for the great presentation. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to race through my stuff in 10 minutes. Let's go. It is the uh, CoLab notebook. So you can play along, sing along if you want um, to the notebook. So here we go. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about like actually implementing this in Python. So here we go. Um, so this is Python. So I hope people know Python, but but, but if you don't, don't, don't worry, just, 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 you know, take this on as a, um, just a uh, you know motivation to learn. Okay, so this is I'm going to import stuff, matplotlib, numpy, and the thing that we're going to need is the Fourier transform. So f of t n, the n stands for n-dimensional Fourier transforms. This function works for any dimensions, and then we have the uh, the, the, the inverse Fourier transform and the shifts. So I'll talk about these later. And it's always good in your program to always initialize a random seed initialize the seeds so, so you can uh, make your results reproducible. So that's a good point. And then I'm gonna make a, a cat image of a 2D cat. And uh, this is just from the, uh, yeah, I, I just made this and, and the actual images in this, on this web page here. There's lots of resources in this prickly Python thing. So go and have a look if you want. So this is just to convert the image from a color to a gray scale map and resize it to uh, 64 by 64. And then, and I'll just normalize the, the maximum to one. So it goes from zero to one. Okay, so that's how this is, that's how you plot. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, so let's take the third transform of the cat. So that's X true. And then uh, this is the big, big X. So I'm gonna use big X to denote to, to, to the third transform. Okay. So I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna run these cells. I've got to run. So, oh, this is CoLab, by the way, Google uh, CoLab Tree Notebook. I'll talk, yeah, just come to me and gather and I'll show you how to uh, get, get your own notebook. So there's the, the uh, so this is, so I took the third transform and the absolute value squared. Okay, uh, it's okay, I'm not sure, but it's okay. Uh, and then that's the magnitude of the cat. The very magnitude of the cat, and this is the the support. Which in this case, I'm just making it a, a a square, a smaller square within the 64 by 64 image. So that's what that looks like. Okay, and then one interesting uh, sort of thing to 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 note about is that whenever people first start doing um, phase retrieval and 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 working on Fourier transforms, they plot the magnitude right. So that it, so obviously you do that. And then people uh, often think, oh no, I'm doing something wrong. Look, it looks weird. Like why is the yellow, th why is the bright spot in the four corners? That's because the, the discrete pair transforms is defined such that the zero zero position is the, the, the origin of first phase. And the DFT is periodic. It, it, the boundary condition of DFT is periodic. So that's why it sort of wraps around to the other side. So, that, so that's why it looks weird. So what you do is you take the FFT shift, so mp.fft.fft shift, and then that shifts everything to the center. So it's more sort of realistic and physical. And then you take the log. Normally we, we just log scale the uh, intensities. And then we get a more sort of a visually 
pleasing thing. So, so don't 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 be uh, confused when you, when you when you first start off. Okay, so here are the actual projection operators that Jeff was talking about implemented in in, in Python. So PS that's the uh, support projection and X is the 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 thing that I'm going I'm going to modify so that it satisfies the support. And I have my support in this dictionary here, which is uh, a Python thing. And then and and the, the the key for the dictionary is just sub. And then you just multiply the x to the to, to the uh, to the to the support to get the new uh, the modified version of your your iterate. So the reason why I'm using a dictionary is is because sometimes in in uh, sort of more specialized face retrieval, you might want to reconstruct multiple things. So you're going to need multiple inputs. For example, you could put the uh, the background in here. And you can reconstruct the background with Andrew Morgan's uh, uh, background uh, aware face retrieval algorithm, for example. Okay, so then PM here is the magnitude, magnitude projection. So this is you take the the Fourier transform of X and you get big X, and you say, hey, look, I'm going to scale the uh, the magnitude of X by its own magnitude, uh, scale X by its own magnitude to, to get rid of the, the its own magnitude and multiply the uh, the data magnitude. So you basically swap the uh, sorry for the sorry for the light. You, you swap for the uh, the 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 the, the uh, the, the, the new the, the old magnitude with the data and the other way that I've seen people doing this is that they use the uh, um, this this way of just uh, inserting the data magnitude by going m equals to uh, so m times e to the i uh, theta where theta is the angle theta is the phase of the the uh, Fourier transform where you can get by mp dot angle so that's another way that people you can do this, so that's good. So let me run this. Oh, someone, what happens in line four if x is zero? Aha, yes, that is uh, precisely the reason why people use this form formalism. I mean, it yeah, so it's bad. If the, if the line, if this zero here, you, 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 you're going to get NANDs. So you could either check for NANs and correct for those, float them or make them something else, or you can do it this way, or you can just assume your data is noisy enough that you don't have any zeros. That's uh, that, that's one way, one way. I've actually always used this and I've never sort of come across any problems if, if for real data. But of course, in simulated data, you do have to check for zeros. Yeah, good question. But maybe but it, 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 it might, there might be other ways. So feel free to speak up if you if you know other ways of doing this. Okay, so here's the difference map. So okay, basically it's you update your iterate by adding on the difference between the uh, the the projections to the two sets, and you weight that by beta, which is um a a, a number between zero and one. Right, and so. It looks like this when you, when you actually write it up. It's not, it's not too bad. So RM is actually called the relaxed projection. And it's relaxed because you kind of, depending on the value of gamma M, you either go slightly into the constraint or you slightly, uh, you don't go slightly, you go slightly away from the constraint along, along the direction of the projection. So that's the relaxed, it's called relaxed projection in that sense. Uh, again, my M is the relaxation parameter, which is also just a number between zero and one. Often, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, the difference map is now that. So it just looks like PS, you know, uh, is R, so RS there, that's RS, and that's PM there. So that's what that's, what that's doing. Yeah. Uh, I think I got this other way around because that says P is. Or, yeah, it, 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 it. so this is why Jeff don't, doesn't. Jeff, Jeff likes HIO because he says it's easier to not to screw things up. I think I might have switched some stuff up here. Not sure if it's either it's either this is wrong or that's wrong. So I'm not going to check now. So <laughs> let's keep going. 
Oh, and I'm returning both the 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 new iterate and the the PS the the, the the projection of the the well the the relaxed projection of X onto the support constraint because I want to plot the uh, I want to plot the the object so so um, and, and calculate the the uh, the error metric so it's 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 nicer if we calculate the PS. Yep, let's go. Okay, here's some shrink wrap stuff. So this is a kernel. So we call a uh, Fourier convolution thing. If you convolve an image with something, we call that something a kernel. So that kernel in this case is just a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a one, it's a square of one, a rectangle function, 2D. And here's the convolution function. It's just literally just Fourier transform X multiplied by the kernel and then inverse Fourier transform. Okay, and if we do that to the cat, X choose the cat, you're gonna see this. So this is the cat, that's the result of uh, convolving the, the rectangular function with the cat. And in the Fourier space is multiplying the rectangular function to the Fourier transform. So that's why you zero out everything outside the uh, that square and then you keep everything inside that square. So that's, that's why it looks like that. So this is called a low pass filter. And that's why it's blurry because you, you've, you've convolved the cat with a low pass filter. Low pass means you, you're passing through, you're letting the low frequency uh, of your first uh, uh, for, for samples pass through. Okay, let's keep going. So this is high pass filtering just for fun. So high pass filtering is actually just the, the inverse, but right? you let the high, higher frequencies through and block the lower frequencies. And it looks like this. So yeah, you pick up the edge of the cat. It's high pass filtering. Okay, let's keep going. Phase retrieval start, look. Okay, so uh, that these are just for, for displaying and keeping, uh, like making some delays so, so the animation works. So here's my dictionary, support and the data, the Fourier matrix data, 41 iterations, uh, the beta value, the, the difference between parameters is 0.7 and gamma m, is, the gamma is set to one over beta and minus one over beta. Uh, that This paper has some details on, on why that should be the case. And uh, I'm starting with random values, uniformly randomly distributed between zero and one, 64 by 64. Here's the uh, figures and this is the loop for loop and difference map look so x goes in and all the other stuff goes in and x comes out and then you just update x so x comes here iterates jumps in here so that's the solution and this is shrink wrap so every 10 iterations i'm doing one iteration of shrink wrap so it's just you just filter this thing and you take the absolute value uh, normalize it and you choose a threshold it's magic numbers and that's going to help us so yeah there's some sort of art and all this because you have to pick random uh, magic numbers um, and you i'm plotting every two iterations sleeping for 0 0.2 seconds let's go ignore that okay let's go ah uh, look so shrink back now and then i'm going to shrink now and now so that kind of thing hey look it's upside down so you should all know why it's upside down because you've heard Jeff's talk. And there, so we went from here to there. 